how long did you live in Lawndale for? I, I was born here in 1933. Uh, actually born in Englewood, but you know my parents and I lived in, uh, in Lawndale here. And uh, <clears throat> until 1958 when I got married to my first wife. And in that time why I lived in Lawndale, uh, um, when I was a baby, I lived. In, you know, we lived on the corner of 100, 145th and Hawthorne Boulevard. And if, if anybody's got a copy of the uh, the history of Lawndale, they had, there's a there's a picture of the garage that was in there. It was Shorty's garage. That was my my father's garage. And behind the garage was a uh, uh, a salvage yard, which was belonged to my uh, my grandfather and and my uncle. And they operated the the salvage yards, and my my dad ran the gas station, and he was the mechanic at that. And I was you know I was a baby in that house, and then shortly after that, then we moved to, uh, over on the corner of 147th and um, and Mansell. It was uh, at the time there was the um, community church. I, I don't know. I think it was just called the community church. It was on the corner of 147th and uh, and Mansell. And we lived across the street. And then in my my school years, uh, starting off, why the kindergarten class was in the back. There was a uh, a room off to the side of the the rear part of the church, and that was where we were where we had the uh, the kindergarten class. Now this is the community church was on the same grounds, the same corner or block of uh, Central School at that time. Now I guess it's called Lucille Smith School. But at that time, it was uh, Central School. And I was there going to that school. And we lived in that area until uh, I was in the third grade. And my parents divorced. And uh, then my mother and I moved into uh, with my grandmother. And we lived down on 161st Street between the railroad tracks and Inglewood Avenue. And from the uh, third grade to the sixth grade, then I went to South School. It was South School at that time. And after that, well, I'm still living you know, on 161st Street from uh, the school years I went to, um, coming back to Central School and did the uh, seventh and the eighth grade. And then from there, went over to uh, Lusinger High School and uh, graduated in 1951. And uh, after that, I, I did my two years of military and, uh, and then 55, 57 and 58, I was going to El Camino. And then 50, I mean, 50, yeah, 55, 56, 57, 58, I got I married my first wife. And, and after that, I moved out of Lawndale. Um, <clears throat> at uh, my experience at, uh, in those years in, uh, in Lawndale, I, um, this, the first part of the Central School, um, not not too much of a recollection I mean, there. I mean, I was just a, you know a small child at the time. My parents divorced, and we you know I moved down there with my grandmother, and and now they're um, was lived there a couple of years, and you know now the Second World War started. Okay, and and during the Second World War, why the train used to come by there two and three times a day. And and it was that was very very interesting, watching that train come by because it, because what would happen is they'd be bringing war materials in their tanks and armored vehicles and and they would have passenger cars there and they'd have the troops on those trains and they were headed to the harbor to load them up and take them over to you know this was uh, the uh, this, they supplied the uh, the Pacific Theater of War at that time uh, from this area. And uh, so, and that was kind of interesting. And then growing up in that particular area, why um, I think um, I, I can remember one time. I don't know what year it was, but there was a, th this was a real rural rural area at, at that time. And um, where, around where I lived, people had horses and pigs and chickens. I mean, you know, rabbits and goats and and you name it, they had them all down there. And I can remember one time uh, the train's going by, and you can, and usually when the train would uh, pass through that particular area, 
from say it would cross Inglewood Avenue and cross Manhattan Beach Boulevard and cross 159th, 160, 161st, and 162nd. Uh, the engineer he would you know, he honked the horn uh, of the uh, of the engine, and I can't remember whether they had bells those. I think it was just a, a beep beep you know the air horn that they had. And this one time, a neighbor's horse got loose. And all of a sudden, you could hear him beep, beep, beep. I mean, he was really hard on the horn. And uh, the horse got hit. And, you know, us kids were all, you know, the, the train stopped, but, you know, but by then it was too late uh, for the horse. And we went over there to, you know, check out the horse, you know, kind of a, you know, sad, actually sad for the horse and sad for the owner. You know, we all knew the horn, owner of the horse. And, uh, you know, that was one of the experiences uh, going up down there. The other, the other experience I had is uh, horses and I didn't really get along very well, but because on the uh, on Manhattan Beach Boulevard, right near the tracks, was a, a riding stable called Tri R Stables, and you could go over there and rent horses and go ride wherever you want. I mean, it was all open land; you could ride anywhere you wanted to, and it was kind of a kind of an interesting area at the time and. Uh, my experience with horses is uh, trying to ride one, on one bareback one time. I fell off and psh, couldn't stay on the horse and hurt my back at the time. Another time, uh, two other times, one time I got stepped on. Another time I got kicked in the head by one of the horses. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, you know, that was just the way of life. I mean, and, uh, and then my, one of my neighbors, he, has, he had a cow and, I remember he was milking the cow one time, and the cow stepped on my foot. I was, you know, everybody running around barefooted too. There was nothing to get excited about, you know, by running around barefooted. And good thing the the soil was soft because I pulled my foot out from underneath because he wasn't moving. That whole, that cow was not moving, and I just, you know, I skinned up the top of my foot. And uh, the businesses that were around at that time, one of the main businesses. Uh, for us around here, the main transportation was the Sunset Stage. You've probably heard that already, and uh, and it was a good transportation system, uh, you know, for this area. It's it serviced uh, the Bay, the Bay or the Lawndale, Hawthorne, Inglewood, and it went through all the beach cities, and you know, and that was our transportation to the beach. You know, and if it, and if it was you usually had to wait about an hour for the bus if you got you know if you didn't feel like waiting, you just lived close enough to the beach, but uh, I just walk to the beach, just walk down there. And I had an aunt that lived in Hermosa Beach and we'd go down there, that was our, my, my grandmother and I would walk, walk to the beach or take the bus down there, whatever. And uh, we had a great time. You know, the beach is close by. It's only from here three and a half miles to the, to the water edge, water's edge. So that, that was a great experience. Uh, as far as the businesses on Inglewood Avenue, there's uh, Leo's Mexican Food. It used to be on 160, uh, seventh, the corner of 167th and Inglewood Avenue, but uh, now it's 160th and uh, Inglewood Avenue, and he's got a you know nice, a good going business there. And uh, and before the freeway came through, where there was on a, on the corner of 161st and Hawthorne was a, a Pronto Pup. You know, it, was, it was a little hot dog stand that we used to. You know, we, we ate many a meal. We'd run down there and grab a couple of hot dogs and bring them back and. Corn, not corn dogs, but uh, hot dogs and, and beans and, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, the other thing I can <laughs> this the other thing I can remember about uh, uh, where we lived across the street on in uh, this is actually Redondo Beach. I always thought it was Lawndale, but it was re actually Redondo Beach, and there was farmland out there, and they used to grow um, lima beans out there. And then whenever they had the the harvest. Why the you know they'd harvest the harvest the beans, but got kids and parents alike. You know when they finished harvesting, there'd be a whole pile of beans out there. We'd be out there picking up beans for you know for a couple of days, picking that stuff up. And then the smell from every household at that time was always the same. Was, you know they're pick, smoking lima beans and ham hocks. So if you want, you know, say, come over for dinner, you'd have the same dinner at your neighbor's as you were having at home. I mean, it was really amazing. And uh, uh, let's see, I can, I can recall reading some of the, uh, the history of Lawndale. 
that in the beginning, back in uh, 1906, when they first started uh, uh, Lawndale, when it first got going, why they were given land for people to um, uh, uh, build chicken chicken ranches. Well, I can remember coming from you know 161st Street to come up to uh, Central School and even even going to Lusinger. There was chicken farms on the way. Uh, coming up, you know, between uh, Gravilla and uh, Fremont Avenues and about 156 to 150, uh, 154th, well, uh, no, 154th to uh, Marine. It was uh, called Compton Boulevard at that time. And, uh, and there was chicken, you know, ch chicken farms there. I mean, I, I just thought, well, you know, I, I didn't know that they, you know, uh, they came by on the way they did, you know free land and you know all you had to do is develop the land that was you know that was you know it was kind of a neat deal and god i can i can recall that there was a lot of empty lots and stuff around where we lived and it my it was my grandmother's house and, and at the time the depression was when i was born was uh, you know a big deal and uh, i don't know they paid about 400 bucks for the their place they were in and, and they could have bought other pieces of property around there for two and a half to four hundred bucks, and but we, you know why, why didn't you buy it? You know when it was so cheap, no, no one had any money to buy that kind of stuff, and it, it was kind of that was that reminds me of my mother. She lived to be ninety eight. She lived she lived with me. me I, I live in Torrance, but now, but uh, at the time she still lived at one hundred sixty first Street up until about ten years before she died. And I was going through her stuff after she passed away, and it was kind of a, kind of a history lesson. Basically, she, uh, my grandfather, to buy that, you know, pay four hundred and twenty-five bucks for it with, a, you know, he took a loan out from the Bank of America, and uh, pay it payable at seven 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 dollars and twenty-five, you know, seven, uh, yeah, seven twenty-five a month, and and, and they and he had a, a ledger. He'd go pay it, and they'd, they'd date it, and they'd initial it, you know, that he'd paid it. But I couldn't believe him. Here, here's a loan for 450 bucks or whatever it was. Just absolutely mind-boggling. And this is back in the, uh, you know, in the, in the 20s, 1920s, because they, they were living there before I moved in there with them. But uh, that was, you know, that, that's, you know, that's the way it was, you know, from my recall. And... Uh, and the only the only reason that my I think my ancestors came to California and wound up here in Lawndale and uh, is uh, they uh, they came they, they started off in Can Kansas and they went to Canada they were trying to keep my uncle out of the the First World War and um, so my grandfather moved the whole family to Canada and they stayed up there you know until the war was over and then they started migrating down here but the other reason they came down here was uh, oil, oil was a big. It was a booming industry at that time in this area. There was, there was. I can recall a lot of oil fields, especially uh, west of uh, Inglewood Avenue and 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 south of uh, Rosecrans. There was a lot of oil derricks out there. A lot of them, and the beach cities were covered with uh, oil derricks, and Torrance was covered with uh, oil derricks, and so that's what that's what brought them out of here. Out here. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, uh, let's see what else. Wow, you know, you, you just covered probably about three quarters of all the questions I got right here. Really? Yeah, you were you were gonna roll, and I thought, you know what? <clears throat> I'm just gonna let you talk because you're you're you're. I mean, you you were flowing. So, but I tell you what, I do have some questions. Let me just check something real quick. Okay. I just want to make sure that. Uh, start asking you some of the questions, because some of these questions are actually geared towards um, different aspects of the, of the documentary that we want to kind of bring out. And forgive me if, uh, if because I, I know you, you've answered a lot of these questions already, but I think if we could just dig just a little bit deeper, it would be very cool. Um, growing up in Lawndale, what, what did kids do for fun back in those days? Well, 
I can remember um, when the uh, Second World War started. Uh, we were sitting in the living room at you know at my grandmother's house, my dad, my mother, and I, and uh, listening to the radio. They had you know we we start off with radios in those days, and uh, we're sitting there, and a flash come over the uh, over the newswire that uh, or the the program that we were listening to that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, and uh, to me I didn't know what that meant. And, uh, you know, but my father explained to me, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, we're at war now. And so, you know, what does that mean? You know, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the guy, would he have to go to war? Why? But him and my mom, I don't know, they were, I guess at the time when we were sitting there, they were probably trying to get back together or whatever, you know, whatever the deal was. But anyway, he, uh, he took off and he went to um, Colorado, but then the next letter I got from him why he had already uh, enlisted in the Army, uh, Army Air Force at the time. It wasn't the U.S. Air Force, it was the Army Air Force. And uh, so, but he was, at the time, he was in his 30s, and they weren't going to send guy. you know, he's too old. But he was a mechanic to begin with, so he just worked on uh, the B-20, B-20, B-24s, B-24s is what he worked on. And uh, so basically that's what he did. But, okay, you know, what, what did I do or what, what did kids do? Well, I can remember riding the sunset stage at, in, in those days. That's how I learned how to drive before I ever got behind the wheel of a car because what I would do when I'd get, every time I got on that bus, I'd try to get that seat where I could watch the bus driver operate the, the vehicle. And so, I mean, I, I knew all, all the gear shifts. You know, I knew where the gears, I knew about the clutch, I knew about the gas, the steering. And uh, they had, <laughs> they all had an old mechanical arm that would si signal a left turn. And then, uh, you know, and, then, and then it would be a bent arm like that for right turns. And, you know, I mean, that was, you know, primitive, but that's, that's what we had in those days. And, uh, and so, Basically, that was an education for me to learn how to drive. And so when I did get behind the wheel, of, you know, I mean, it was, it was a little strange, but not that strange. And from Inglewood to, to here, I knew where every stop sign was. I mean, I was, I was just like I was the bus driver. And uh, so that's basically how I, that, that's one thing I did. You know, in the movies, uh, a lot of times we'd, you know, we'd go around and collect bottles and cash them in and, We'd walk to Hawthorne and go to, they had a couple of movie theaters up there. And, um, but if we went, really wanted to go further, you know, we had to take the bus on up into Englewood. And that was an, one other thing about the, the transit system is you could go to Hawthorne, you could get on the five car and you go all the way to LA. In fact, is you could go all the way to Eagle Rock on, on the five car. Many of the times, you know, you know, wasn't anything to do on a Sunday or something like that. We just go hop on the five car and just take a ride all the way to Eagle Rock, and all the way back. And you know, for what the cost was, I don't know. My, you know, my mom would, my mom or grandmother would pay for it. You know, whatever, whatever it happened to be. And and to get the news in those days, during especially during the Second World War, you know, there's no TV. You know, we didn't know anything other than what you heard over the radio. Well, we'd hop on the five, you know, get to Hawthorne, hop on the five car, go into L.A., and we ha they had what they call the newsreel theaters up there. There was two of them, and we'd go up there, and that's how we'd get the, basically the firsthand news, the news that they wanted us to know about. They didn't tell us everything, you know, and we since everybody's since learned that uh, there was a hell of a lot more going on than, than what, uh, you know, what we knew at that time, and so. You know, it was always it was always positive for our side. You know, but that's uh, that's political. I don't need to go any more further there. But um, uh, what else? You know, I, I told you about how I learned how to drive. Well, what I would do, you know, if I was playing by myself, I had a steering wheel and a and a. I told you I had, my grandfather had a, a salvage yard well down at the house where. Where my grandmother lived, behind the house was a, was an old barn, and there was a lot of old parts, automobile parts and stuff like that. So I grabbed a steering wheel, and made up a steering wheel and a gear shift. So I'd practice driving in my in my backyard, just sitting under a tree with my my steering wheel and 
And that's basically how I learned that. Uh, is there's always enough kids in the neighborhood too to you know to get up uh, get a softball game or a, a touch football game or uh, and then I put up a, a baske basketball um, court or just you know a basket in my backyard and we'd play half court basketball back there trees and stuff would get in the way but you know that's <laughs> you make do with the best you can you know and that's what we did. Uh, and then even across the street, there was no houses and stuff. We'd play football out there and baseball. But we'd, I, made, I made up some, uh, some hurdles so that we could go out there and run track, you know. We'd go over a couple of hurdles and, you know, just, just, just for practice. Never did it in competition, just go out there for something to do. Oh, that's another thing. My, my father, at the time, uh, one time, he was like a junk collector, and he would, he'd go around and... Uh, he uh, found a, uh, a discus that a guy named Tom Lieb, I guess it was back in the 20s, he had, uh, he had this discus and he, and he used it in competition. Well, anyway, my dad found it in some junkyard someplace and bought it home for me. So I'd go out there and I didn't know, how to, I didn't know the right way to throw it, but, uh, but we found that. And, and then we, and he also bought, me a, bought a, a shot put for me. So. And so that's that and, you know, playing hide and seek, you know, with the, you know, you want to get the girls involved and you start playing hide and seek. <laughs> and anyway, that, you know, and the girls would play softball too with us, you know, of course we'd stick them out in the outfield, you know, where it couldn't cause too much damage, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but we still, you know, that's basically, Basically, what we did there was no you know TV where you could sit down like they do today, gang up in somebody's living room and, and sit and watch TV. There wasn't any of that. You know, there there wasn't any TV. The, you know, the closest thing we'd get to TV was go to a movie, and and in those days too, you could go and see two movies, plus a newsreel, and plus two cartoons for a quarter, something like that, and then you could even just. You know, that'll all be over with and start all over again. You could just go do the same thing again. Just just sit there. <clears throat> all day. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> you, you, you had mentioned that you went to uh, uh, Central uh, School and you also went to uh, 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 South School. Um, you're actually the only person I think we've interviewed that actually attended South School. Can you tell us a little bit about these schools that you went to, uh, and if you could focus a little bit on South School, because like I said, we, we don't have anybody who's actually attended school there. So. Well, I've got, I've got some pictures here. Of course, <laughs> I don't know whether that's going to do you any good with it. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, oh, you know, Tanisha is not here right now. She's uh, my girl who's doing uh, uh, most of our scanning. Um, you're here! Yay! All right. Oh, you, you snuck in while we were uh, talking, huh? I did. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dan has a bunch of photographs oh. here. If you wouldn't mind maybe scanning those up real quick while we're uh, uh, doing? doing that. Hi. This is Tanisha. This is Dan. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, what's your name? Tanisha. Tanisha? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Th th okay. Those are of South School. Okay. And wait a minute. I'll get, I'll get some more of South School out of here. Because... Uh, Okay, that one's this this one here is in that mural over there at the uh, at the uh, at the library, and this is the other one that's over there. You know, I mean, those are all, all that was the sure, garage. garage. Oh, wow. Yeah, Very see cool. now here's another picture of it also. Excellent. Okay, um, This this is an, uh, another one of, of the market, you know. Like we're we're on wow. on Buren's. Well, right, y the the empty lot that's right here, directly across the street was where that market was on 147th Street. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, well, it's self-explanatory. I just said the uh, the the gas station was on the corner of 145th and Hawthorne Boulevard, and it was on the south. West corner. There's a florist there right now. Okay. Okay. 
So that's where that was at. Okay, this was only taken a couple of years ago. My mother passed away in, in, in uh, 06, and I think this picture was probably taken uh, in uh, 05 or 04. Mm -hmm. And when she passed away, she was 98 years old. So, so okay, now here's, this is me at, at South School, my father at South School. Oh, wow, that's cool. Cool. You got your dad and you uh, in uniform in front of the school. Yeah. Here, here's a couple more. In front. That's. Those are all in front of South School. Okay. And these. Are, that's. That's my football team. <laughs> and some of those. You'll see some of those guys in 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 the school pictures there. Oh, okay. okay well, wow. Look at the padding they're wearing. And, oh. Which, uh, uh, I guess, okay, and, uh, basically nothing. Uh, okay, this guy here, with, with uh, the only one with a helmet on, Janice, Janice's husband, okay, this is George Gibbons. Janice is married to Bob Gibbons. That's, uh, yeah. that's, George. He's, he's, yeah, that's George. They called they call him Bud. I, I didn't know they called him Bud. He was always George to me. You know, we've got to get... Janice does not want to do on-camera video stuff, but we'd probably get Bob to come in and do it. So you know what? Everybody keeps referring to Bob. We're going to have to get Bob in here. Get, get Bob. Yeah. <laughs> have yeah. Bob show up. Charles, yeah. actually. But, uh, yeah, Bob. This is all that you want me to scan? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, did, did you have any other photos that you wanted uh, to? Well, I... Are, are those duplicates, or...? Well, this one here, uh, this is another of the store, but... Um, I think, well, I don't know. Oh, these the, the same pictures? Yeah, I think they are the same pictures. Okay. All right, thanks, Felicia. Okay. Uh -huh. Appreciate that. All right. Very cool. Thank you for bringing those photos in. That's great. You know, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually taking Janice's collection of photographs and we're digitizing them. So we're not only doing this for the the video, but we're actually creating digital photographs of all the photographs that she has, uh, you know, for, you know, um, putting on discs, so this way we can, you know, preserve them, uh, you know, that way too, so um, it's going to work out pretty nice, this has been a very uh, uh, cool project. Okay, uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, South School, Central School, and did you go to Losinger? I went to Lucinger. Okay. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, about those schools and any memories you can think of, uh, of going to school there. Well, for me, school was a struggle, <laughs> for one thing. Uh, let's see, uh, central school, I was, you know, like kindergarten, first, second, third, and my parents uh, uh, split up at the time. That was... Uh, uh, that's a psychological deal. It's kind of a, yeah, just a psychological deal. It was a, it was a hard time, and I think um, after when I went to South School, then it seemed like uh, life was kind of a struggle for me, basically. Uh, some of the kids that uh, you know I played, you know, I had my football team there, uh, and um, and a lot of those kids, uh, you know, we. The kids that went, okay, I felt like basically a stranger. I came from central school, and then I moved down there, and I went to south, started going to south school. So then when I came back to central school, well, you know, most of us all come from south school uh, to go to central school, and then when we got out of the eighth grade, then we went to, all went to Lusinger, all the ones that were sta still stayed in the area, basically. And uh, uh, Lusinger, I... Uh, I played football. I played f football all four years, C-ball, uh, my freshman and sophomore year, and then my junior year I played B, B football. And then, then my senior year I, I played varsity football, but the only reason is I got, they have a, a system what they call exponents. And uh, I, was, I was too old to play B. I wasn't very, I was only 150 pounds at the time. And, and the, my senior year playing varsity football. The year before, when I was a junior playing B football, our team, 
I think it was the first time that Lusinger ever had a championship football team. We had a really a good, good football team, and but all those guys were all seniors and they all graduated. So then a bunch, you know, us, the B team, now we move up to varsity and we didn't grow much. We were still like a B team. So all, all the teams that we played football against, like the Bay League at that time was, was comprised of Lusinger, Torrance, Redondo, El Segundo, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills and Inglewood. That was the, B uh, the, the Bay League at that time. And, you know, that, that was all the teams, that was all the high schools that were around here at that time. And, uh, and we, got, we got beat pretty good. The only teams, the only time, the only games we won, we, we beat L.C. Gundo and we beat Beverly Hills. The rest of them, we couldn't, couldn't beat them. Cause, and I found out you know, quite a few years later what the reason was is like uh, Torrance, Redondo, Inglewood, Santa Monica, uh, they, they had over 2,000 students. Lusinger, we, could, you know, we had about 1,200 students, so we were just outmanned from the start. And, uh, you know, and that was the reason. We had some good teams, uh, other teams. They had all, Lusinger always had a good baseball team, always had a good baseball team. And, they, and I think they had a pr uh, pretty good size or a good um, water polo team. But as far as the, the women's sports, I don't know whether they even competed against the other. They probably did, but I didn't know it. I didn't pay any attention to that. But uh, uh, I, I said it before, you know, School was a struggle. I, you know, it just seemed like everybody. I mean, they studied a little bit and they they'd get it. You know, I mean, I had to study. Tw it seemed like twice as hard as anybody else to to get through school. And, but that was me. That was just uh, probably had a dyslex dyslexic problem. And uh, but in those days, nobody recognized that. You just figured, well, you're just slow. You know? So that's the way it is. And but you know, I got through. Managed to get through it. And, uh, and uh, let's see, what else? Those. What were some of the things that <clears throat> teenagers used to do uh, back in the day? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. We had the lighthouse. You probably heard about the lighthouse on the corner of uh, Rosecrans and Hawthorne Boulevard. We used to hang out there. Hawthorne Boulevard was a good cruising street. We'd, we'd cruise from all the way. All the way into Eaglewood, make a U-turn, come back around, and just just that that was our cruising street. And uh, there was um, the lighthouse was the main deal there. And 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 uh, tell us a little bit about the lighthouse. Huh? Yeah. You have any stories uh, about the lighthouse? Ah, uh, well, there was a lot of fights over there, and I was in some of them, but. Uh, they, uh, yeah, you know, it was just, it was a neat place. You could pull in there and, and uh, I mean, if, even if you're by yourself, you're going to run into somebody that you wouldn't, you know, that you knew, that you, you know, that you, uh, you know, some of your buddies or, or friends from school. And, and uh, but, you know, they had good food. And, uh, but it was just, a, you know, and they had a good sized parking lot where, you know, a bunch of us could park there and just hang out. And just like, you know, just like today, you know, a place to hang out. And, uh, but, it was, you know, and a lot of times that was the, the meeting spot, too. You know, so, well, we'll meet you at the lighthouse, you know, because so, so, everybody knew where that was at. But from there down, I, I can't remember any stopping off places. There wasn't any drive-ins like that. Uh, as far as some of the bars, why, you know, had the Red Barn was on the corner of, uh, and this is when I got older where I could was able to drink by, uh, they had the red bar and they had dances and, you know, a cowboy, it was just a cowboy bar. I heard it was pretty rough. Uh, I guess it was, pretty much, pretty much it was. And I can remember, uh, and then just this side on, on the corner of 167th in Hawthorne is a place called The Hut, which is still there. In fact, as I, I celebrated my 21st birthday in there, to the, <laughs> to the chagrin of the owner and Harry and Fern. I don't think they appreciated me. And uh, anyway, they, uh, you know, once I celebrate, you know, I said, well, I'm, I just turned 21. I'm celebrating, you know. So now they go and check everybody else's IDs, you know, a little late. But, 
but uh, that place and uh, uh, what else? I had a, uh, there was a pottery uh, factory on, on the corner. I think it was on 167th and Hawthorne Boulevard, you know, right on Hawthorne Boulevard. My neighbor, a, a lady, I took the, the, the article out. Uh, I, had, I was going to bring it now, that now, this one, but, but she's my neighbor. But she worked there, and, and she, n now she has all white hair. She's a real, real slender woman. She's a nice-looking woman, she, but she, you know, she's basically my age. But at the time, the picture, they took a picture of her while she was working at this pottery. I can't remember the name of the pottery place, but it, it, it's... Millwalks, right? Yeah, I think that's what it was, yeah. And uh, she, uh, and, and they, the, the, the uh, dishes and stuff that they make, they, she says she still has a set of them that, you know, that was made there. And uh, they show the picture of her, and she's got black hair, and, you know, and she's, she was, you know, a slender woman, but she's a nice, nice lady. And uh, when I walk my dog, I stop by there and, and talk with her and her, her sons, usually out there. Uh, let's see, what else in Lawndale? How about Hawthorne Boulevard? <clears throat> I know Hawthorne Boulevard is, uh, has gone through you know, several different incarnations. I know it was originally Railroad Avenue because the railroad used to come down it. Um, and then, of course, they, moved, they took the railroad out, and then it was kind of like a ditch, you know. And then eventually they paved it. They put some parking in, and then you know. And then just recently, I you know they did the uh, uh, the big renovation. It looks you know Hawthorne Boulevard looks beautiful now. Yeah, through Lawndale, yeah, it does. Lawndale's done a lot for it, or you know a lot to it. And so let's talk a little bit about Hawthorne Boulevard. Um, I know that it used to flood, and they would you know. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, okay. Hawthorne Boulevard. Okay, at a hundred and. Uh, okay, 154, 156th, Hawthorne Boulevard used to flood out. I mean, we used to have some hellacious floods around here. You know, just a, a small rain would just bring a lot of water. But on the corner of 156th, and uh, that was another uh, deal that we, we used to do. The, there used to be an outdoor roller rink. I don't know what the name of it, but it was on the northwest corner of 156th in Hawthorne Boulevard. Now there's a lumber yard there. Okay, but we they, there was an outdoor. What they did is they laid a bunch, uh, uh, some asphalt down, and I imagine it was probably the size of a half half of a football field, the size of the of this the roller rink, and and then they put this polyurethane down over the top of it, and you know, and just and they had a an office, and you would check in, rent skates, if, or if you had your own, you just just pay the fee and go on in and uh, and and skate. And that was one of the business. And we used. I remember when my friend and I. We used to put white white T-shirts on, and we just we were ornery little farmers. But we we'd get we'd out there, and we'd there'd be people skating along, you know, in pairs and all that. And we just purposely fall in front of them, and just just to see who could get the dirtiest at the end of the end of the night of, of roller skating. That's just roller skating, not roller blade. That you know, nobody had thought of that yet. And, and, and no skateboards yet. In fact, it's over here right on 147th Street. I think they moved the, the fire station, but it used to be on this side of, I guess, what would that be, Osage or whatever, you know, it'll be a block this side of where it's at now. I think it's on the corner, but they had it, it was right directly across the street was a building that was fair size, and they had a roller rink in there also. And so we used to go in there and roller skate. But it was more fun. At, at the the outdoor one because it was larger, you know, had more room to roam around and, and you know get crack the whip and, and all that kind of stuff, just stuff that kids do, you know, and uh, it, that was that was one of the other uh, things that we got that we we all could do, grown ups and kids too. So, and uh, it was that God I can remember there. We had a lot of fun, a lot of fun at that skating rink. Uh, and as far as flooding, yeah, flooding was a was a big issue. Okay, on the corner on on uh, in 1955 when I was going to El Camino or when I was getting ready to start to go to El Camino, uh, one on okay 159th, 160, 161, 162, a contractor came in, dug up all the streets, 
and, and there was no sidewalks at the time, and he was going to put in sidewalks. Well, this contractor went belly up. So, and it sat, you know, this, this whole project sat there for nine months, almost a year, almost a year. And we had one of those big rainstorms. And we, we'd have to park on the other side of Inglewood Avenue because we couldn't come down our street. If you did, you, you, know, you took a chance of getting stuck. And then, you know, and then we'd have a little dry spell, and then it would get hard enough where you could drive on it. And then I, I pulled my driveway, and I still got stuck. And, uh, but I, you know, I'll never forget that, though, because that was, a, that was a real big fiasco for a long time in 1955. And, uh, but you know, we managed to get through it, but that was another catastrophe that happened in Lawndale. Well, how, how deep would the water get when it would flood like that? It'd go over the wheels. You'd go over the wheels. I mean, the whole wheel. So the cars would flood out. You didn't dare try to go down any of those streets. You try to get in, the, you know, 156 was always the worst. And if you, uh, if you tried to go down that street, I remember a friend of mine, uh, Freddie Fredericks and his, uh, Freddie Fredericks and his old man, Fred Fredericks, and, you know, and the whole family lived there on, right across the street. And it was right across the street from the, that roller rink. And, uh, you know, they they had to, they would have to park down on you know, Hawthorne. They'd still be parking in the water. You, still, you know, it wouldn't be, a, but it would be up to the bottom part of the wheel. But it wouldn't be up over the wheels. But they go down if they went down to their driveway, it was over their wheels. Wow. And and I can uh, I can recall this one this happened one time. One of the rains. This had to be back in the in the 1930s, uh, we lived, ac lived across the street on Mansell, across the street from the church and, and central, central school. Well, the north, north of the, uh, there, was no, no, there was no homes out there. I mean, it was just a, a vacant field. And I can remember <laughs> my dad got a, uh, had a two by uh, 12, and he would put it from the back porch to the running board of the car, and then we'd Walk down there and then hop in the car to go for a ride, but they all, those kind of cars. I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what kind of car it was, but it sat high. It sat pretty high, and and my dad was pretty good at, at you know when it come to automobiles, you know how to how to operate them and, and all that as far as you know like that was a water a flooding situation. So he he could pull down that driveway and in fact there's that driveway still there. I go over there and I mean, go over there. But, and there's a house setting where that house, the old house, sat, but I don't, I don't think it's the same house. But, but the driveway, there's still a driveway, like an alleyway, there, still there. And, and it's only you, you go down 147th, and you go on Mansell, and you only go maybe 100 yards, and you'll see the dry, the old, the old alleyway, and it goes up several blocks up to, up, uh, up to the, towards the west. Very interesting. Wow. So. <clears throat> You had mentioned that you had joined the service. What branch of the service? I was in the Navy. In the Navy, so was I. I was in, uh, I was in during the Carter administration and the uh, early years of the Reagan administration. Well, I, I was in during, okay, my active, I, was, I joined the reserves. And uh, that brings up another story. Uh, you know, one of, one of my buddies on, on that football team. But anyway, uh, I joined in, at that time in, I got out of school in 1951. Well, you had six months to make up your mind, or otherwise you're going to get drafted. And and I I didn't want to get drafted, so um, what I did is I wound up joining the Navy Reserve, and they had a reserve unit in Hawthorne. Okay, you know where the railroad tracks cut through the center of Hawthorne, you know, you know east and west. Well, backed right up to that. In fact, is where the uh, the police station is. Yeah, where the police station is, right across the street was the the reserve center, Navy Reserve. And so that's where I went up there and joined the Navy Reserve. So I had to do four years, you know, reserved, you know, but I had to do two years active duty. Okay, so in '53, January of '53, I uh, elected to do my my active duty. So they sent me down to San Diego, Point Loma, and then Camp Elliott. I, when you were in, they, there probably wasn't a Camp Elliott, was there? No, they had the recruit training center in, on Rosecrans, 
Uh, yeah, that's where it was. That was the Point Loma. Uh, okay, well, they, they, the first six weeks, you know, we just checked into Point Loma, and then they bust us up to uh, Camp Elliott. And that was like the outskirts. It was out on the desert, basically, is what it was. There wasn't anything out there. And, uh, in fact, just I-15 goes right through the middle of where that base used to be. And uh, uh, so I did 12 weeks of boot camp. And when, when I finished in, in boot camp, why, um, they, they sent, I think it was probably, probably about 60 of us or something like that. They sent us up, they brought us up here to Long Beach, Long Beach Naval Station. And while at the Long Beach Naval Station, well, they had, they were, what we did is we set up the rock program. And uh, they had, uh, the, uh, the guys that were in, in the colleges all over the country in the rock program, they would come there for their, their training for a six weeks training period, you know, during the summer. So, and we were sent there, you know, they had a bunch of barracks and stuff on the, on the naval base that were left over from uh, World War II. And so we had to unsecure them, you know, in other words, we had to make it presentable. And plus, uh, they had some barracks you know, that it was going to be for these uh, new officers. And so we cleaned up the whole bit, you know, and, and got it all chip shaped so that they could come in and do their training. And, uh, you know, and then when, it, when they left, well, then we went in and we secured everything. So when it was, when they secured everything and, you know, Doyle being a, you know, near the front of the uh, alphabet, why, well, they took the first six of us and they, I went into <laughs> special services. And so I stayed there. I, I spent my whole time, my whole tour of duty in Long Beach. Wow. Oh. Well, that's great duty. My, my, my mother was happy as hell. She, you know, she, because there, that was the other reason I went, you know, was going to go into the, I went into the Navy. I had a friend of mine in, in high school who went through, all, went from South School, Central School, Lou Singer, and played football together, you know, a real good friend of mine, and he kept talking about, he had a, a cousin of his that was in the Marine Corps. Well, I finally learned how to read by then, and I, you know, everything that I heard, all the Marines in Korea were getting killed, all of them. And so I, I, you know, I don't want nothing to do with that Marine Corps. I'm going to go. And so when I, uh, I, I remember I was working nights at the time, and he was waiting for me one morning. And you know, when I got off work, and he said, "Well, I'm going down. Let's go down and join the join the Marine Corps." And I says. I ain't, I'm not joining the Marine Corps. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm joining the Navy. And that's all I said. And he said, all right. So he wound up joining the Navy, but, but I didn't say reserve. I didn't think about saying reserve. I just said, I'm joining the Navy. And so I went up here and joined the Navy Reserve, and he went down, and he joined for four years. So, but he, you know, he got to see some action. When he said he was on a cruiser, and they were... You know, they they sailed pretty close to uh, Korea to draw a fire, and he said he got knocked down. I said a, a shell hit real, real close to him, and he got he was knocked down. He wasn't in, you know injured or anything, but so anyway. But when I got stateside, and got you know Long Beach Naval Station, my mother was just she was elated, you know, because well, because I'm because I'm an only only child, so. So, I, I mean, I, I was kind of disappointed because I had been working in the aircraft industry up until that time. You know, I worked at North, then I worked at North American Aviation, and, and I, I could say that I worked on, helped to build the, the F-86 Sabre jets, which were being built and then sent over to Korea. And uh, I, liked, <clears throat> I liked working on airplanes. And uh, so when I went in the Navy, uh, I wanted to get... I really wanted to get in the Navy Air because if I if I had got in the Navy Air, I, I was planning on staying in for 20. I was going to you know, make it a career. But I got the white stripes, you know, and if you're a Navy guy, you know what the white stripe means, you're, you're going to be a deckhand. So, and I wasn't, that wasn't my interest. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do my two and I'm out. And by the end, the, the war was over anyway, or pretty close to being over. So, but... Wow, I was I was on the USS Saratoga, which I actually uh, well there was CV three um, 
prior to CB60. CB60, they, they built uh, just prior to Vietnam. And so it saw a lot of uh, action in Vietnam. It ended up, uh, um, it was involved in the first Gulf War, and they decommissioned it in 1995. It's a sister ship of the Forest Doll. Remember the Forest? Did you hear yeah, the forest? yeah. The yeah. Forest Fire? <laughs> no, it was John McCain was on that, it was on the, uh, uh, the Forest Doll. And he was there when that, uh, when, when um, they have this classic footage where uh, um, apparently uh, they were charging, you know, one of the missiles and it just took off right across the deck, hit, hit another couple of planes, they blew up. And so, uh, and it's funny too because they, they showed, you know, the footage of the planes burning and there was this chief petty officer. He grabbed a, a bottle of PKP, you know, and started running towards the planes to, you know, try to put the fire out. But then what happened was it, uh, the fire got, blew up one of the fuel tanks, and then there was a massive explosion. And uh, they fought that fire for three days, 24-7, until they finally got it out. Because all the fuel started uh, leaking into, you know, the, uh, the holes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going down into the ship, and suddenly the inside of the ship was on fire. It was a, it was just a, a, a nightmare. I mean, it, at some, I think it was in the middle of the, of the second day. They thought that they might be losing the ship and that they would have to abandon ship, but uh, they ended up finally getting control of it and ended up getting it put out by the third day. Pretty crazy uh, thing, but they learned an awful lot about <laughs> firefighting when they, uh, you know, through that. Uh, that particular incident, but um, uh, yeah, we, we, we used to be ported right alongside the forest stall in Mayport, Florida. I was actually sixth fleet, so mm -hmm. uh, but gosh, I kept remembering I just every time I had an opportunity to fill out a dream sheet, you know, uh, I'd always put Long Beach Naval, you know, uh, uh, weapons uh, station, and, and then they uh, would never give it to me. <laughs> Closest <laughs> I got was Alameda up in Northern California. I spent yeah. the last two years there. That's that's one thing about the Navy is that the the needs of the Navy comes first, and exactly the, exactly what happens and if in there. Uncle Sam wants you to have it; he gets you. It that's too. right, exactly. <laughs> that's that, that was my experience, yeah. especially at the naval station. They can't take away your birthday. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Oh my goodness. Okay, so um, uh, let me see here. Um, you know, you've covered so much ground. I mean, I, I kind of hate to ask you these questions and have you, you know, repeat yourself. Um, and again, you, you, mm -hmm. you left Lawndale in 1958. That was right before the incorporation. Do you know anything at all about the efforts to incorporate? No. No? Okay. It's just, uh, just other than what they have in, you know, in, uh, in the history of the, you know, those books that uh, Osborne uh, put together. I mean, I mean, the stuff I've read in there, that's, that's all I'm, I, mean, I know as much as you do because you probably read it too. Uh, but as far as living here and experiencing any of that, no, I don't know. Oh, oh the, the other thing is, it just dawned on me. The street I lived on, 161st Street, the mayor, Harold Hoffman, hell, I, you know, I've known him for years, years and years. We, we lived on the same street, and he still lives down there. His house is backed right up to the freeway there. You you go by you go off that off ramp. Of course, they build a big wall now. You can't. But before they put that wall up, you could look right off and look right back down in his backyard. Yeah. Did you did you know Harold growing up? Yeah. Okay. So you were pals or? Well, no, we weren't buddies or anything like that. We just knew each other because of you know school, basically being in the same neighborhood, and, you know, and stuff like that. Were you approximately the same age or? He I think he's a little older than me. He might be a year, maybe two years older than me. Yeah, see, I'm 76, and I, I don't know how, I, he, I think, I know he's older, but he's not. Yeah, I think he's like maybe 77. Yeah, right, and right in that area. All right, very cool. Um, what about uh, um, the San Diego Freeway? Because I know that it they, they took them a while to actually build it. Okay, well, there was two guys that, that I know that their, their businesses were taken. I mean, of course, they were kids at the time, but their parents... Uh, Reinhardt de Department Store, um, you know, I think it was uh, Bob Bob Reinhardt, and then, um, damn it, I was going to remember that name. There was a feed store, Bender's, Bender's Feed Store. Were there, you know, Reinhardt's and Bender's were right there together. And Bender's, you know, he had all the, all the hay and the, and the feed for all the animals that were 
basically in the area. He, I mean, he wasn't the only one, but but he was one of the suppliers for for a lot of the animals in there. You know, that's another thing was on Hawthorne Boulevard, but. San Diego Freeway went right over the top of that. Uh, what else? A lot of homes, you know. A lot, you know, are, as far as uh, now, I probably I probably knew some of the kids, but I don't know. I can't think of who they would be now. Uh, I mean, this one guy uh, that I was going to go in the. Well, we went in the Navy at the same time. Why well, his house was on 164th Street, and I think the back part of that was. Go, the freeway is close, close to where he used to live, very close. Uh, what do you think about the freeway? Did, did it hurt or did it help Lawndale? Well, uh, now it hurts because the damn thing, I mean, it's, you know, it's like a parking lot, you know. But in its day, I think it helped a lot. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a great need for it, a great need. But I'll tell you the thing that, you know, as far as transportation and all that goes, they can go back. And I mean, and this is this is second guessing by going back, I, you know, and who the powers to be were. You know, I mean, they really screwed up because we did have a transit system and and it, and, went, and it was called the red car and it used to go. <clears throat> Down by the beach, it took it, it went through all the beach cities. Okay, right on the beach, you know, just maybe a hundred yards, not even a hundred yards, maybe sixty yards in from the water's edge. The train, uh, the you know, they had a streetcar, and the train could come down through there, and and they go and start a redondo. Okay, at one time, here, here's another little piece of history. At one time, the city of Redondo Beach, the harbor down there, that was going to be L.A. Harbor. That was going to be the harbor. And they had they had two piers down there. They had one of them called the lumber pier, and then they had another one for you know receiving and sending shipping and stuff like that out to the boats that were anchored out. Now I'm talking about the the, you know, the tall tall ships. And, and they had a rail system that went down there, went right out on those piers. Okay, and one one rail system went I just described went right by the beach. And the other rail system came right down Hawthorne Boulevard, and when it got to the corner of Redondo Beach Boulevard and and Hawthorne, then it you know it, it would have gone right at an angle. You know where uh, El Nido Park is down yes. here? Okay, it went right through El, El Nido Park, and there's a building down there that's it's an apartment building now. Was the was the train station? That was a station there, and then there was a. They had a tunnel that went under the tracks that go over there now. Uh, there was a tunnel that went under. They th I, I, I see now they've since fill, filled it in. But that, those train tracks went right down and made a turn. Are you familiar with Redondo High School? Oh, yeah. Okay, on the north side of Redondo High School, those train tracks went right down into, right down into Diamond, right down Diamond into uh, Redondo Beach, right down into the harbor. Wow, really? Really. I don't Good friend of mine who lived right off of uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's, what's the name of the street? Lucille, I think, and uh, and Diamond. Lucia and uh, no, Irina. Irina. It was or Irina. Irina. Okay. And, uh, and Diamond. Yeah. Well, at the far end, you know, just before you get, you know, there, it's like it's like a right of way. It's still there, you know, and the train and the and the streetcars used to go down through there. Or a streetcar. Uh, they had a. Uh, they they only had one, here. I think they only had one set of tracks that went down that way. You know, like say from Hawthorne. But after you know, you get up in Hawthorne, then they had two sets of tracks. Interesting. Yeah, we used to, we used to r ride wheelchairs down Diamond to where like you know the police uh, uh, station is. Down yeah. There. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, yeah, we used to, we used to take that. We used to take the wheelchairs down to the pier, the Redondo Pier, and they had this like little arcade thing, and we would do wheelies and stuff because we thought like the girls would think that like you know oh these poor guys but look how talented they are on their wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you poor guys! Oh yeah, we can't walk. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. But anyway, um, well you know ultimately I think that's pretty much.
much all the questions I have. Um, is there anything that like that we haven't talked about, or I haven't asked you specifically that uh, would be something that maybe you want to uh, talk about? Well, on the phone, I told you, you know, I talked about the, the Optimist Club. You know, I worked on oh, that. God, that's right, the Optimist Club. You helped build that building. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, I wor worked on that one. And, and it's, uh, what do they call it now? It, it's, it's, they got a, some kind of a used car dealership in there now. And, but anyway, we, I helped build that. And that was back in the, uh, God, 50s? Probably, you know, uh, you know, like 49, 48, 49. I mean, I was still in high school, and I was working on that, uh, you know, with uh, this, this friend of mine, Deron Avery. And his parents had a, um, a little mama papa store on the corner of 159th and Hawthorne Boulevard. And, and we, you know, we were in the same grade together, you know, basically, uh, you know, 8th, 7th, 8th, and, you know, and then, then high school together. And him and I worked on it. But then they had the guy that, that supplied the materials, uh, Lawndale Building Supply, was on the corner of Manhattan Beach Boulevard and, uh, and Hawthorne Boulevard. And, and Bill was guy, I don't know what his last name is, but big old guy, nice guy, great guy. Anyway, he, he supplied all the stuff you know, for that Optimus Club, you know, and we built that, you know, helped build that club. Where is it located again? It's uh, 100, uh, between one. 56th and Manhattan Beach Boulevard. It's on the east side of the street, but it's it's just the next building next to McDonald's. McDonald's is on the corner of 156th and Hawthorne. And then you go the, there's a parking lot. There's two actually two parking lots, and then you got the building. And that's the old Optimus Club. And then the next one is a uh, uh, what the hell is it? Uh, I think a motel or something like that. Hotel. Hotel, I guess it is. Hotel, no tell. Yeah, <laughs> one, one of those, right. All right. Yeah. Uh, 